biblical prophecy is literally a discourse or a narrative of future events, things to come, but emanating from divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God. That's biblical prophecy. Now as recorded in the New Testament, prophecy is the prediction of events relating to Christ's kingdom and its certain fulfillment of which Jesus, we're told, would not have us to be ignorant. He instead wants us as believers to be alert, knowledgeable, and strong in faith. In last week's part one emphasis on our two-part series entitled, Comforting Words in Days of Confusion, Isaac and I, along with special guest senior pastor Carl Brogy of Community Bible Church in Beaufort, South Carolina, we defined prophecy and the overall purposes for biblical prophecy of which the Bible is full. Last week we talked briefly about why when Scripture is a full one-third prophecy, why so few pulpits today are actually preaching it. And this absence of preaching is particularly alarming and amazing when we are living in the times when prophecy is being fulfilled so quickly and comprehensively as we transition from the church age to the tribulation period. Now last week as well, I referenced a few short verses from Revelation chapter 1, 1 through 3, where we're told that there are at least three motivations, benefits more or less, to why we should saturate ourselves with biblical prophecy. The Apostle John writes in that passage, he says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show to His servants the things that must soon take place, He made it known by sending His angel to His servant John, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that He saw. And he said, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, and blessed are those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near, or at hand, as the King James would say. So since reading and hearing and keeping the Word of God, the prophecy of this book is a command which brings blessing, logical question, we should want to do it, shouldn't we? In addition, such verses as in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 in those sections tell us that the knowing of the rapture of the church and the unfolding related events should bring understanding and clarity so that this knowledge can motivate us as believers to, among other things, comfort one another in these days. And then understanding these things and these times, we as believers should be greatly motivated, not only for our own benefit, but that for our families and our friends and our church family and the unsaved in particular. In today's program, we'll move to the consideration of the biblical chronology of events, both fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled, as well as the biblical teaching about the church, the rapture, and the comfort it provides to us who understand what the Bible clearly teaches. And with that, I welcome back to the program right now, Dr. Carl Brogy. Thanks for being back with Isaac and I, Dr. Brogy. It's a pleasure to be with you, Sam, and you, Isaac, uh, for staying in the Gap uh, ministry. Grateful to be here. Uh, uh, Carl, we really enjoyed last week's program, and we want to get right into this one because uh, what we're talking about today is so informative, but also tremendously exciting. Let's start here. Uh, from Genesis 3.15 to Christ's first coming, and you're going to lay out the order of events in, in the next segment, but I would like for you to, um, if you could, uh, connect the importance of understanding chronology of events, and that within prophecy things don't just happen, there is a chronology. Why is knowing prophetical chronology such an important aspect of knowing biblical prophecy? Well, that's a tremendous question. And of course, you know, the biblical view of the world is linear. In other words, God gave not only the beginning, how things would all came into existence and how it will end. And that's why, sadly, evolution and even theistic evolution that some evangelicals have sadly adopted denies that basic principle. 
So the scripture is clear that there was a specific beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, and there's a specific end. And only the Holy Scripture gives us that chronology, beginning with Genesis 3.15, we call it the Proto-Evangelium from the Latin, the first gospel. It's the first time where God specifically refers to his Savior, and he takes us all the way through in the Old Testament to the first coming, but also in the Old Testament to the second coming. Uh, the Old Testament is complete uh, with hundreds of verses that speak of Messiah's return to the earth when he will rule and reign and establish his kingdom. And the details are filled in in the New Testament. All right. Uh, fantastic. And ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, you got a basis for it. Bob, prophecy is very detail-oriented. It lays out chronology of events. And I'm telling you, I, I know it, and Brother Carl didn't say it, but, it, but it's a part of it. It speaks right to the very character and nature of God, who is predictable and very detailed, and it means what He says, and He says what He means, and that's what we read when we read prophecy. When we come back, we're going to walk into the, the events leading up to, and what in part of, first coming. We're going to talk about the second coming, and we're going to include complain about the rapture, and why that is so important that we understand what the Bible says about that. Truth flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter with hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide. A website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and we're, we're so glad to have our special guest that he actually came back again this week, that Sam and I, we didn't, we didn't scare him away, uh, bombarding him with all kinds of questions and forcing him to, in one program, go through so much scripture. That's Dr. Carl Brogy. Um, and Pastor Brogy, you know, as a pastor who's preaching expositorily, you're, you're used to taking a lot of time to really dig into these sermons that you've prepared. But as a radio host who has to be prepared to give a, a defense of what you believe at any second, any question, uh, you know how to, to handle this sort of medium that we're in. So um, we're just very honored to have you back. And we're ready to ask you a bunch more questions. I apologize ahead for uh, bombarding you. Um, but we've already mentioned that you know, starting all the way back in Genesis, we have the fall and the curse in Genesis chapter 3. So Genesis 3.15, we see this curse, and in the curse is wrapped into it the prophecy of, of the coming, you know, Messiah. And so if, could you kind of give us um, an overview, this, uh, you know, summary of what goes on between that curse in Genesis 3.15 to the first coming of Jesus Christ? Sometimes we talk about the advent or the first advent of Jesus, but the first coming of Jesus Christ. Well, obviously, God made man as a free moral agent. That's mm -hmm. part of being made in his image and likeness. So he gave man a choice, and he warned, from any tree you can eat, but if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. And they died that day uh, immediately on the inside, spiritually. They lost their intimacy with God. They began to die physically, so we're born dying. We're getting older, and if the problem's not solved, we'll die eternally. And so in Genesis 3.15, God gives his solution, how he can stay holy and just, and yet at the same time express his love for the creation. And so he makes a promise of a savior. The God who sets the penalty, the wages of sin, death, is willing to step out of heaven and pay the penalty. And in the Old Testament, he unfolds how we would know that God would do that. So he establishes a nation, Israel, within the nation, a particular tribe, Judah, within that tribe, a family from which the Messiah would come. And the Messiah would fulfill specific 
prophecies by which we would know that he was God. Isaiah 53, which is like an eyewitness standing at the base of the cross 700 years ever before it happens, details point by point by point what the Christ will do, that he'll be pierced through for our iniquity. Uh, Isaiah writes that in 700 BC. Uh, Psalm 16, Psalm 22 references such things a thousand years before it happened. Uh, crucifixion is not even invented until about 300 years before Christ. And yet God is detailing how Messiah would die, uh, the events surrounding it, that his body would not undergo decay. And so the resurrection prophesied in the Old Testament is God's announcement, as Paul says in Romans 1, 4, that Jesus is God, that death could not hold him in the grave because he never, ever sinned, proving his sinlessness and his ability to be our substitute. So Jesus did not come as a martyr. He didn't come as an example to a cause. He came as a substitute to die in our place. And that's the theme of the Old Testament, the first coming of the Messiah. It's a major, major emphasis. And, and that's so exciting to see that and that we, we get to look back and see those prophecies fulfilled in that first coming. And, and we can uh, look through that. And every year, even as we celebrate what we call Christmas or the, the birth of Jesus, seeing, seeing all those things come in and know that the second coming will happen. And I, I've already seen some of Sam's notes. So I know that Sam is going to question you or ask you about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But for the here and now, where we're at right now in this unique period in between these two comings of Jesus Christ, can you talk to us just a little bit about um, th this period of time and the importance of, of this time that we live in currently? Well, we're in what theologians call the church age, and there's a lot of terms that we adopt uh, that summarize the biblical doctrine, like the word Trinity, not found in the scripture, but the doctrine of the Trinity, one God existing in three co-equal, co-eternal persons is found there. And so Daniel is given a prophecy in Daniel 9. Uh, they had been in Babylon for nearly 70 years for 490 years of disobedience, where every seventh year they did not allow the land to rest. And so he wants to know what's next. And so God now looks 490 years into the future and he gives the first 69 weeks. And then there's a space of time we call the church age. The church did not exist in the Old Testament. Jesus said, I will build my church. It was a future entity. And when you allow scripture to interpret scripture, you discover that the church began on the day of Pentecost. It's a unique body of believers made up of Jew and Gentile, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation that are being gathered together as the bride of Christ. One of these days, God is going to remove the bride of Christ, and then the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy will be fulfilled, and that's known as the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble that is prophesied in the Old Testament as well. Wow, you did that so fast, uh, 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 Carl. <laughs> Let's just move from that, because I'm going to come back and ask you probably a follow-up question on that. And, uh, well, I actually, I think I have time. I'm going to ask you this question right now. This period of time, these 2,000 years now that we're in since Christ's ascension to where we are right now, uh, the gospel is primarily being communicated by the Gentile world. Prior to that, the gospel was, the light of the gospel pointing to the coming Messiah was to be done by Israel. Israel's been kind of set on the side here a little bit. Can you comment why, why in God's economy did He um, inter, in, uh, insert this 2,000 years, this space between the 69th and the 70th week of, uh, of, of Daniel we're talking about? Why? Why did he do that, you know? Well, because of their unbelief. Uh, John writes, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called children of God. And so when the church begins, initially it's almost all Jewish. In the first uh, great sermons that are done, it's all Jewish converts. The first Gentiles don't come to the faith until Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and his family. But what begins to change is because as the gospel's preached and there is habitual rejection by the nation as a whole, he's always had a remnant, but the nation as a whole said no to Jesus. Why? Because of unbelief because of self-righteousness. Paul says, seeking to establish a righteousness of their own. In Romans 10, they rejected the Messiah. And that's the major reason uh, Gentiles reject him today. And so God is now largely using 
a Gentile church to fulfill his plans because of Jewish unbelief. But one of the functions of this 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, we call it the Great Tribulation, is to bring Israel to faith. It's through the turmoil and trial of that day that their eyes will be opened and they will believe that the one they had pierced was indeed the, the savior of the world, and God will then begin to evangelize the world through the Jew. Hmm. All right, which walks us right into this. First coming, you went through that, Isaac asked you the question. We've, we're talking about, you've explained, this interim period, this 2,000 years, in which we're living now, we call it the church age, uh, where Christ is building the church, and we who are believers are the bride of Christ, that we're in this period. Okay, now that walks us up to the second coming. The disciples in Matthew 24, when they were talking to Jesus, they wanted to know about the second coming, because the first coming already happened, they could see Him. So they wanted to know about the second coming, and one of the things that I've learned from you, and even in your teaching, is that the first coming is not one event alone, it's a series of events that are put together. Well, the same thing about the second coming. Would you explain the chronology and what's included in now the second coming, that which lies ahead of us as we are talking to you right now? Well, the next great event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. People say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible. Eternal security is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Sunday is not in the Bible. But the doctrine of the catching up, every believer believes in the rapture of the church. The question is, how will it unfold? For we shall not all sleep, but we shall be caught up. Uh, we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so that's going to happen next because God is going to be done largely with the Gentile bride and he will change focus, as you mentioned, Sam, to the nation of Israel. In a seven-year period, it's not just a number we pull out of the sky, it's specifically termed that way by the prophet Daniel, reaffirmed by the apostle John. It's split into two halves. 1260 days each. The first half is a time of tribulation. Right in the middle of that seven year period happens the abomination of desolation that was spoken of not by the historian Daniel, but by the prophet Daniel. Jesus saw this as future, and he'll go into the temple, a rebuilt temple, he'll commit a heinous act, and then the tribulation will get so intense, Jesus said, unless those days had been cut short, no flesh could have survived. At the end of that seven-year period, there's a space of time before, because the seven-year period doesn't begin until the peace treaty is signed by the Antichrist with Israel, and there's a short period after, so no one can set the day or the hour, but then the visible second coming will happen to the earth. At the rapture, he comes in the twinkling of an eye. At the second coming, every eye will see him. And the rapture, he catches us up in the air. At the second coming, his feet are planted on the earth. He splits the Mount of Olives in two. There's a river that goes from the, um, the Temple Mount all the way to the Dead Sea, such that men can fish in a sea where there's no life. Those things can't be spiritualized. Those prophecies have never been yet fulfilled, but they will be. And that's when the Messiah will literally reign on the earth for a thousand years. There's a reason for that. He doesn't just take us to heaven. He fulfills some promises to Israel about a coming kingdom. Mm. And that will conclude with uh, the, the new heavens and the new earth. All right. Well, you just gave a great overview of the next events uh, chronologic. Now, let me go back here now to the rapture. Mm. Caught away. That's the portion in uh, First Thessalonians that the Apostle Paul says, knowing these things, comfort one another with these words. Here's my question to you. Uh, we know that Paul said, here's the rapture, and he talks about it, so that there can be comfort. But combine that with why the rapture is important. What, many people believe that the church is just going to march right into the tribulation period, and we need to plan on walking right through the tribulation period, and then we'll all be caught up at the end of the tribulation, one resurrection, and that'll be the rapture. Uh, you don't have much time, but clarify that. Well, there's great comfort in the rapture, and the church at Thessalonica believed in the bodily resurrection. What they were confused on concerned the orders of events. 
Paul had been there three years, preached on these issues. Since he had left, some of their loved ones has died, and they wanted to know, well, what will their state be? How will things unfold? So Paul reminds us, we'll not all sleep. We'll all be caught up, he tells the Corinthians. Uh, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, he tells Thess the Thessalonians, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So when you're dead, your body isn't laid in the grave, but absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so your departed spirit will be brought back with Jesus, reunited in the body. The dead in Christ will be the first to come out of the grave. And then those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up and there'll be a reunion in the sky. So he wants to affirm to them, your loved ones who've already died, they're not going to miss anything. In fact, they're the first to come up out of the grave. And there's great comfort in that, that we're going to be with them, we'll see them. And of course, the bride of Christ is not going to be beat up during the tribulation, black and blue, and then God's going to say, well, come on, the marriage supper of the Lamb now. No, um, the, the church has always experienced the wrath of Satan, the wrath of man, but not the wrath of God. Christ and the Christ shouted to Telestai, it's finished. It means paid in full. Will not be objects of the wrath of God. And the tribulation period is a time of wrath upon the earth, judgment on the earth. And it's not because God's being cruel. It's his final wake up call to bring people to faith mm -hmm. in Jesus. And ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to ask Pastor Brogy to say, now in light of these things, what difference does this make? And what difference should this make in your life? Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Dr. Brogan, we've learned so much from you and we've asked so much of you over the last two programs. You've taken us through uh, literally from Genesis to Revelation to the Revelation. And uh, I'm just as we come to this culmination of these two programs where we've had you on, could you just kind of wrap this up with the application that we can take away from biblical understanding of prophecy, what that means for us as Christians in this age? Well, God gave us, Isaac, the prophetic portions of Scripture, not to make us smarter sinners, but to make us more like Jesus Christ. Amen. And part of becoming like Christ is obeying what we know, and when we obey what we know, we grow. And so if you're listening to me and you're born again, you've been entrusted to a great commission. As you go, you're to make disciples. That's not a missionary verse. That's a verse given to every believer in the body of Christ, that as you're going through the week and God provides open doors that we should pray for, we should seek with clarity, with power, to share the good news of how they can be forgiven. Time is running out. And to those who do not know Jesus, we would do well to pay attention to what we've discussed in these days. If you're not 100% sure that if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven, you need to settle that issue. You say, well, maybe I can settle it after the rapture. If this happens, no, actually the Bible teaches in 2 Thessalonians 2 that those who heard the gospel prior to the rapture with clarity and power will not believe. Paul says because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved, God will send upon them a deluding influence. Not to mention, we don't know either prophetically or personally how much time we have. This could be your last day on earth. And Jesus admonishes us, like he did in John 12, that even in this day, if a person habitually says no to Jesus, they're hardening their heart. That's what the Jews did. Though they had seen many miracles done in their presence, they refused to believe. And then he said, for this reason, God hardened their heart. God blinded their eyes. God stopped their ears. It's a judgment. You can't play with God. He says, today is the day of salvation. When you hear his voice, that is the message of scripture, don't harden your heart. And when we say, no, 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 we're hardening our heart. And there'll come a time when the final callus is put on 
where you cannot believe. In fact, Jesus said the devil's given permission to take the seed that they may not believe and be saved. So today is the day to get right with the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Call upon him and he'll forgive you. Dr. Carl Brogy, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you took that challenge. If you do not know Jesus Christ, today is the day. Do not put it off. And for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, prophecy is not to scare us, it is to prepare us. It is to motivate us. And I hope that you are encouraged. That's our prayer for this program all the time. You're encouraged. You are edified. You are motivated. You are strengthened in your faith to live confidently in these days of confusion. And I pray that you, in fact, will be. Thanks for watching us today. Share this program with your friends. Let them know, have them watch it. Never a program more pertinent nor relevant, I believe, than these last two programs. God bless you, we'll see you back next week.